now, right here in Genesis chapter number 11. We're going to go ahead and jump right into the chapter tonight. We're going to begin in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Verse 2, And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now, one thing that really stands out in this chapter, in the very beginning, just by verse number two, and it relates to where we ended last week, it relates to the latter portion of chapter number 10, is that when you're reading verse number two, it says this, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Notice that this is, this is a pronoun that is being used for an antecedent. But where is the antecedent? Well, it makes perfect sense if the antecedent is left in chapter number 10. And it is referring to the people of the earth after the flood. And what they are doing is they are coming together at one particular point where they all speak at this time one language. Chapter number 10 at the very end ended in verse number 32. And it tells you these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So what is the they referring to? It's referring to these are the families of the sons of Noah. It's referring to all of those that are the people of Noah. When we see here in verse number 2 of chapter number 11, it's referencing back to all of those that got off of the ark. All of those that got off of the ark. Now, I'm going to get deeper into this in just a moment. And I want to, I want to show you something. But look at verse number 3. It says, and they said one to another. So they're saying one to another. Go to. It's like, come. Let us make brick. <coughs> Excuse me. And burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone. And slime had they for mortar. Verse number 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Now, I also uh, touched on this at the end of last week. We're in uh, Genesis chapter number 10. And that was that many people teach here that they believe that they are literally trying to build a tower all the way up to where it actually is gets to where God dwells is in heaven. But I believe this misunderstanding comes from the word heaven. Now, the word heaven in the Bible is not always referring to where God dwells. That is referred specifically to as the third heaven. But if you remember in Genesis chapter number one, the Bible actually says that the firmament God called heaven. In Genesis 1, like verse 12 or 13, right around that, it says that God called you know, uh, the firmament heaven. Then right after that, what does it tell you? It tells you that the fowls are flying in the firmament. So what does that mean, that the fowls are flying in heaven? It also says that in the firmament that God sets the lights. He set you know, the sun and the moon, all of these things. So is that a specific reference to where God dwells? No, of course not, right? Obviously, God dwells beyond that. God dwells in the third heaven, specifically. The first heaven is where the fowls fly. The second heaven is where the sun and the moon and the stars are located. Outer space, we normally refer to that, right? Then the third heaven is where God dwells. Here, I believe that they're just saying that they want to build a tower that reaches to the sky. They want to build something that is profound, that stands out. Why? Because they want to make a name for themselves. That's what they said, that we, that we can make a name for ourselves. It's not, oh, what's their goal here? I want to go to heaven so that I can actually just make it to heaven, my, you know, my roundabout way of getting to heaven. Now, I will say this, and I want to look at this quickly. <clears throat> I believe that this is typology. It is, it is definitely a figure or a type of people trying to work their way to heaven. And I am referring to where God dwells when I say that. Because obviously we know that the Bible very plainly teaches that salvation is not by works. That salvation is by grace. It's by the grace of God. And what can be any harder than building a tower? They're, you know, they're making bricks. They're burning them throughly. They're taking, you know, they're getting slime for mortar. And how much work would that be to build a tower all the way to heaven in that sense? It'd be impossible, right? 
You would be working forever. You would never do it. You would not be able to ever reach where God dwells, would you? you even It doesn't matter if you had all of eternity. It, it's impossible, like Brother Josh said. You would not be able to do it. You would just keep working and keep working and keep working. And there would be so many problems that would come in your way. You would never be able to do it. We know what? The same thing goes for salvation. Right. You can spend all your time. You can do. You, know, you can try this route. You can try that. You can try to clean your life. You can try whatever you want. But you know what? You're never going to be good enough. Right. You're never going to have the skills that are required, if you will. You're never going to be able to build that tower. You just have to go by the grace of God. You just have to go by just the free gift of salvation. This actually reminds me of Jonah. I want you to go over to Jonah chapter number one. <laughs> this be, being a type of man's works or man trying to get himself to heaven. You see a, a, a strong type of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jonah. <clears throat> in the book of Jonah, but Jonah being that type specifically of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right after the book of Amos, Jonah. <clears throat> so here in the book of Jonah, in the book of Jonah, in the very beginning we have, you know, Jonah obviously fleeing. In the uh, very beginning of chapter number one, we have him fleeing. Right? He's supposed to go to Nineveh and preach, but he goes, he wants to actually go to Tarshish. He goes down to Joppa, he takes his toll, or pays the toll, he jumps on the ship, he's on the ship, and you have Jonah, if you look down at verse number six, it says this, so the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, what meanest thou, O sleeper, arise, <coughs> call upon thy God, if so be that God will Think upon us that we perish not. So if we would have read prior to that, that there's a great storm. It's very tempestuous, the Bible teaches. Everyone's getting concerned. Everyone's getting worried. They th they're thinking they're going to die, right? And Jonah, during this period of time, it, you know, oddly enough, which would be very strange in my opinion, Jonah is sleeping. Jonah's down, down, you know, down in the bottom of the ship, and he's asleep. And someone comes to him and wakes him up. Well, if you cross-reference this, you don't need to turn there to Mark chapter number 5. Mark chapter number 5, and it is verse number, I think I have the wrong verse written down here. It's in the, the, the earlier portion of the chapter, actually. No, it's, it's chapter number 4, that's why. Chapter number 4, it says this, And he was in the hinder part of of the ship, referring to Jesus, asleep on a pillow, a storm is, has arisen. The same exact situation, people are scared, they think they're going to die, and then they say this, <clears throat> asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? So it's a very similar situation, this is one of the parallels that you see of Jonah and the Lord Jesus Christ. Beyond that, if you go back to Jonah chapter number one, you look down at verse number seven, it says this in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 7. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. And it says that they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Well, this is also symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ because you had something in the Old Testament sacrifices called the scapegoat, which represented the Lord Jesus Christ, right? They would cast lots. The lot fell upon one, they would let him go, and then the other one had to be, you know, sacrificed there. They would lay their hands upon the one, and they would send him off into the wilderness with all the transgressions laid upon him. That picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, what did they do for his garment and for his raiment? They cast lots for it, right? You keep reading here, and you'll, and you'll realize that the lot falls upon Jonah, just like the lot falls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They asked Jonah, basically, what do we have to do to get out of this? What do we have to do to be saved? Look at what it says in, <coughs> in verse, number, verse number 9. And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and then they, watch this, and then said unto him, what hast, thou done, what hast thou done this? Why hast thou, I'm sorry, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, verse 11 is what I want to focus on. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. So, what did they have to do to be saved in this type of situation? And what was the only thing that would have pleased God in this particular situation? What was the only way out of it? 
Jonah. So Jonah, with the, the lot being cast upon Jonah, picturing the Lord Jesus Christ, Jonah had to be the sacrifice, just like the Lord Jesus Christ had to be the sacrifice. And then every, everyone else was saved. Notice right here that Jonah actually tells them what they have to do. Look at verse number 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So Jonah told them what they have to do. Is that easy or hard? In this case, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Just five guys grab a guy and toss him over the sea, right? Well, look what they do. Verse 13. Nevertheless, saying, so even though they knew what to do, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. All they had to do was grab Jonah and just toss him into the sea. That's it. It's just like salvation. It's very, very easy. And God will tell you what to do, but for some reason, men just try to work their own way. They try to just go their own way, but it's impossible. Look at what it says again. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. To bring it to the land. So are they trying? They're trying hard, aren't they? Watch this, though. But they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. You know who that was? Who was causing this storm? It was God, wasn't it? It was God that was causing this storm. It was impossible. It was impossible for them to make it unto shore. It would not have happened. And when I read the story of the Tower of Babel, I think of this story. I think of the typology here of salvation and man trying to work his way to heaven. And, and just as impossible as it was for these men to row to the shore, it's just as impossible for a man to work his way to heaven. It's just as impossible for those men in the tower, with the Tower of Babel to build that tower to reach unto heaven, isn't it? It never would have happened. It's impossible. But look at the rest of the story, verse 14. It's very interesting because watch. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. Again, representing the Lord Jesus Christ. What did, what did Pilate say about Jesus? He said he was innocent. He said he washed his hands of all. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. He said he's not guilty. Right? <clears throat> Look at what it says next. O Lord, that for thou, O Lord, hast done... As it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. There's a sacrifice. That's all they had to do from the very beginning. And you know what? How, the way in which they, they got that, verse 14, that salvation. The same way, uh, be, this being a type, of course, the way that someone gets salvation today. So many people spend their life trying to work their way to heaven, but they cannot. They will not make it. It'll never happen. You'll never be good enough. You're not strong enough. You can't row the boat to shore. You can't build a tower to heaven. It's not going to happen when it's easy in the first place. All they had to do was, we beseech thee, O Lord. We beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. What did they do? Call upon the name of the Lord. And calling upon the name of the Lord is biblical. This is something that gets attacked by people constantly. And it really is from... It's really from ignorance of not understanding calling upon the name of the Lord. That's really what it is. You have, you have to look at Romans chapter number 10, verse number 13, and understand that that verse is saying, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, what, however you interpret that verse, that verse says, Those that call upon the name of the Lord are going to be saved. Right after that, it tells you and explains to you, you know, it talks about, uh, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? The believing, of course, is what saves you. But this is what people do not understand. They don't understand that it is not just a, a, a belief in facts. And I explain this every gospel that I give to anyone. It's not just believing the facts that saves you. It's not just believing that Jesus is God, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. That's not what saves you. Just having faith that that's true is not what saves you. Right. And, you know, even believing that salvation is by grace through faith alone is not what saves you. <laughs> believing in the doctrine of eternal security is not what saves you. That will not save you. There are plenty of people that heard the right gospel, that believed that that was the right gospel, but never chose to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they died and they went to hell. They knew that that was the right way to heaven. They knew that that's what the Bible actually taught, but they chose not to believe it. 
The belief is a choice of trusting. It's a choice of putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It happens at a moment where you're passed from death unto life. It's not just, oh, now I understand that Jesus is God. Oh, now I understand that, you know, uh, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Now I understand. It's not the, you know, once you get the very last element of the gospel, you're just saved. No, you understand all of those things. You believe that it's true. <clears throat> now you have to choose to put all of your faith in this. Because right. you know what happens a lot of times? I preach the right gospel to someone. They admit to me it's different than what they've heard before. I ask them if they want to change their mind and trust the Lord to save them. And you know what they'll say? Not right now. Do you know what happens at the moment that someone calls upon the name of the Lord? They're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I always explain to them, hey, it's not the words that save you. It's not the prayer that saves you. What it is that saves you is the trust and the belief in your heart. So at this moment, I want to pray a prayer with you, and I want you to choose right now. It's up to you, but I want you to choose to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's trusting. It's not just a faith in facts. That's what people very much misunderstand. And that is why it's biblical to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Now, do you have to be speaking specifically to God, and how does that work? And No, you do not have to be just speaking, and it doesn't have to be out loud. There are mutes in this world, right? There are people that just do not have the faculties or the ability to be able to speak, right? To make audible noise. They have something wrong with their vocal cords. They have issues, you know, with their body where they're not able to talk. So God, did God just damn them to hell? It's ridiculous, right? You can pray in your mind. <coughs> All you have to do is just call upon the name of the Lord. I don't even believe that you have to even be speaking directly to God. I believe you can just make this decision on your own. And a perfect example of this is Acts chapter number 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. And he just asks him. if the, you know, He tells him he wants to get baptized. Here's water. What does enemy to be baptized? He says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And then what does he say? Speaking to Philip, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right? Did I quote that correctly? I did? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It says, and you know, both of them went down to the water, Philip and Eunuch, and he baptized them, right? So notice, he says to him, what did he do? He called upon the name of the Lord. He called on that name, didn't he? And that was what he was trusting in. <coughs> that was what he was believing in. That was the moment where he made the choice. He understood the gospel before that. But Philip wanted to hear him call on the name of the Lord confess with his mouth. He wanted to hear him make the decision. There are plenty of people that know the right gospel, but they choose to walk away and not to believe it. So you have, you have to understand that's where calling upon the name of the Lord comes in. Calling upon the name of the Lord is biblical. Amen. There has to be a moment where you choose to trust Jesus Christ. It's not just faith in the facts. Right. That's important to understand. There has to be a moment. That's what repent means. That's why all of this is so, you know, misunderstood by so many different people, this subject, because, you know, we don't know what repent means. We don't know what this means. We don't understand that it's trusting. They don't understand the difference between just faith and facts and actual putting your choosing to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of mind where you choose to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's what we see going on here the, the, in, uh, in type. We see the men that are on the ship with Jonah. We see them trying to work their way to heaven. It's not enough. Just like so many people, you knock on the door, they're, they're nice people. And by man's standards, they're great people, right? We would say, oh, this is a really good family, right? Of course, they're all sinners. But they seem like good people. And they're really sincere. They want to get themselves to heaven. They want to go to heaven. But they don't know the right way. What are they doing? They're rowing hard, aren't they? They're, you know... They got bricks, they're making bricks, they're burning bricks, they got more, they're trying their best. But they're never going to do it. That's what you need to go out there and tell them, you'll never make it. You're never going to be able to make it on your own. You'll never get yourself to heaven. You'll never build that tower, you'll never be able to build it. You will never row that boat to the shore. It'll never make it. But it's easy, there's good news. It's easy to get to heaven. Just call upon his name right now. Amen. Just Amen. ask him to save you, and he'll save you. It's by God's grace. I'm so thankful that salvation, sometimes you get numb to it, sometimes you forget about it. I am so thankful that salvation is just God's grace. Amen. God's grace where he just says, hey, you don't deserve it. You don't have to do 
anything, and it doesn't matter who it is, you don't have to do anything to get to heaven. All you got to do <coughs> is just trust me, and I'll get you there. I mean, what better deal? You know, what we, you couldn't even dream up something that's a better deal than that. Right. It's the greatest deal that has ever existed right. to all of mankind. To you know, to a group of people that are that are just sinners and wicked, that are just you know, the heart is deceitful, is, is wicked above all things, and, and it's, it's all evil. None of us deserve to go to heaven, but God just says, just call upon my name. Amen. You're never going to build that tower. You're never going to row that boat to shore. It'll never happen. Oh, Catholic, oh, Mormon, it'll never happen. It doesn't matter who you are, you'll never be good enough. Right. You'll never be good enough. And so I was explaining to this woman last night that I was giving the gospel to. She was asking me some questions, and she really got it. And she got saved, but I was explaining to her about loss of salvation. I guess she went to like a Pentecostal church. And I asked her, I said, from what I just explained to you, does it sound like you have to be good to get saved? Because she, like I said, she was questioning eternal security a little bit. And I was like, does it sound like you have to be good to get saved? And she was like, no. And I was like, could you, get good, could you be good enough to get saved? She's like, no, you have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then what changes and what makes you think that you could be good enough to stay saved? And she was like, I guess, I guess that makes sense. I mean, what kind of answer can you, can you give to that? You know, if you're not good, en if, you, if you can't be good enough to get saved, why would you think that you could be good enough to stay saved? And I asked her, I said, you know how many people? This is when I knew she really got it. After that, when, and I could see on her face so that I asked her this question, I said, do you know how many people would lose their salvation if they could? And she's like, all of them. That's exactly right. right. It's totally by grace. Right. Like I said the other day, you know, in the, the oneness Pentecostal sermon, you can go back to Genesis chapter number 11. Like I said the other day in the oneness, <coughs> excuse me, Pentecostal sermon, if you don't have eternal security, you do not have the grace of God. These two doctrines, you know, are part and parcel. They go together. They're like two gears, and one doesn't turn without the other. They need each other. They are, you know, they are stuck together. They're, you know, one that you can't have one doctrine without the other. You cannot have, you know, the, you know, you cannot have. That's what people want: the grace of God. Everybody says, "Oh, I'm saved by grace," but I got to keep my salvation. You're not saved by grace, then. You're not saved by grace. Ultimately, you would have been getting yourself to heaven. It's like it doesn't even make sense to when you stop and think about what the one that's Pentecostal say because they say. <coughs> Or just any Pentecostal or anyone that believes in a false gospel. You believe in Jesus and you're saved. But then from that point forward, for the rest of your life, you've got to be good to stay saved. It's like he did nothing for you. Yeah. Think about that. Right. Just He just kind of gets you in there, but then you've got to just like stay in there. You're, he hardly did anything. It's like, what in the world? Why would you even need him then? It's ridiculous. Right. So it's like grace of God, 0.1%. <laughs> My good works, 99%. You know, 99.9 .9 it'd be. You know, if, it should, if he just gets you in the door, but then the rest of your life, 70, 80 years, let's you live a long life, you got saved at 10, right? You live to 80. For, so for 70 years, you got to just be a good enough person to get yourself to heaven. You don't have the grace of God without eternal security. The grace of God... Is, is the grace of God is what saves us. And what you, you would be the one that's actually saving yourself if for 70 years you're the one doing everything that needs to be done in order to get yourself to heaven. When you got there, who really got you there, friend? Because for 70 years you were the one keeping God's commandments. You did. You did if that's what you believe. But it's got to be by the grace of God. Nobody could build that tower. Nobody could row that boat. This is a perfect picture of Man trying to work his way to heaven. But the Bible is very clear. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Look down at verse <coughs> number 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. So notice there's two things being built. In, so don't overlook this. There are two things that are being built or built. In. It's a city and a tower. And if you go back, it also says that in verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower. So don't overlook that. It's very important we understand all of God's word. So there's a city and there's a tower that's being built. 
Also, another thing I forgot to, to point out is where this city is located. Look back at verse number two. It says this at the end of the, the verse, the second to last clause. It says that they found a plain, and then it says this, in the land of Shinar. Now, does everyone remember the land of Shinar from last week? The land of Shinar is where uh, Nimrod's kingdom was located, right? Nimrod's kingdom. Now, he had multiple kingdoms. If you look, it says... It says in verse number 10 of chapter number 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kelni, and then it says this, in the land of Shinar. So notice all of those kingdoms were all in the land of Shinar. And then we looked up the land of Shinar shows up in Daniel chapter number 1, and it's talking about Babylon, which is where you know, Babylon comes from the word Babel. These two words are derived, one word is derived from the other. Of course, Babylon would be derived from Babel, right? So the land of Shinar is the land of Babylon. The land of Babylon specifically is the kingdom, if you will. That's the kingdom specifically, but that land is called the land of Shinar. So that is where they are building this, this particular city and this tower called, <coughs> called Babel. Go back over to verse number 6. It says this, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now I want you to notice God's attitude towards this, towards everyone, <coughs> everyone gathering together, all the, you know, these, these different people, if you will, nations that came from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He is not happy about this, and he does not like this idea. He says this, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do. Notice this too. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Does it sound like God is pleased with what they're doing? Notice he doesn't like the idea that everyone has become one people, right? The idea that everyone has become one nation. Everyone's gathered together. Everyone's a part of the same city right now, aren't they? Every single person on the earth right now has moved together practically, and they're all living together, and they're all of one language. And notice, God is not, you know, uh, thrilled about this idea, if you will. God does not like this idea. I want you to turn uh, real quick. Let's look at Revelation chapter number 13. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of uh, symbolism with this. Of course, it being in Babel, which is Babylon, and everyone being of one language... And there being one kingdom that's going to be what? Ruling over the entire world. Now, what does that automatically make you think of? Not only that I said turn to Revelation chapter number 13, but you should have thought of the new world order, right? You should have thought of end times Bible prophecy where everyone is gathered together under one um umbrella. There's a globalistic attitude where we're all going to be using the same currency. We're all going to be speaking the same language. We look back at Genesis chapter number 11, and it reflects the New World Order perfectly, doesn't it? It looks like they have the same goals. And what are they doing? You know, it, it's almost, you know, uh, idolization of lifting up man, isn't it? Where he says, we're going to build a tower that reaches all the way to heaven, and we can make a name for ourselves, right? You see the, the proud and the, pride, the prideful attitude of man. We look at Genesis 11. Now, if you look here at Revelation chapter number 13, this is, of course... The chapter of the beast. That's why the, 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 the number 13 has uh, you know, bad connotation to it because of Revelation chapter number 13. I don't know if you know that. Have you ever heard of people talk about, you know, don't go to the 13th floor of that building, right? You know, just 13 is supposed to be an unlucky number. Well, that's because of Revelation chapter number 13. That is the reason why. I want you to look at verse number 1. <coughs> says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. If you remember when I preached through this particular chapter, this represents two things. It represents the kingdom, but also at the same time it represents the Antichrist. Look at verse number 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world, look at that, all the world <coughs> wondered after the beast. So the whole world, this man is injured, 
and the whole world wonders after the beast. Now, you know, a hundred years ago, just 60 years ago, really, well, <coughs> maybe a little bit longer than that, about 80 years ago, exactly, what, what the whole world would not be able, be able to wonder after the same event when it happens, would they? You know, maybe they had at that point telegraphs, but that was not instantaneous. I don't know, uh, you know, the, the lag time or the delay on a telegraph, but let's go back before electricity. Let's go back just, you know, 110 years ago, right around that time. The whole world wandering after the same event would be not even close to possible within even, you know, uh, well, how long would it take? From, from for a message to be sent out from the United States of America just by ship with the technology that they had of ships and, and land in, let's say, 1890. I mean, weeks. It, would, it takes like a month to sail. You know, with the, at that point, sometimes, I think some, um, I've read somewhere, I cannot remember the resource, but it was like three months that it took from like Europe to, does that sound correct? I think it's three months from Europe to the United States, the east shore of the United States. I think the trip was three months when they would sail back and forth. I mean, at least, let's say a month, let's say weeks. That's a long time. The whole world is not wondering after the beast. So you can see how the technology that we have today is what makes this particular prophecy to be possible. And what, how people are thinking, like, how is the whole world wondering after the beast? But you know what you see here is you see that they are unified, aren't they? They're all coming together and they're all wondering after the beast, right? Look at what it says next. <clears throat> and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now look at verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tab tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So notice that. You have one man with all power over the entire world. I mean, that is scary. When you know the Bible and you understand how sinful just man is in general, let alone the stinking Antichrist, that should be scary to you when one man has all the power of all kindreds and nations. And notice what it said right there between nations, actually, and kindreds. It says all kindreds, and it says, and tongues and nations. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. We see how everyone is united here. We see in verse number 7... There's a one world religion. Everyone's doing what? Everyone's worshiping the same object. Everyone's worshiping who? They're worshiping the Antichrist. Look at verse number, look at verse number 11. And I, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exercised with all the power of the first beast before him. And watch what it says again. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And, he, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles. Notice that everyone is wondering after the beast. The whole world is coming together. He has power over the entire world. He has a mark that you can't buy or sell without this particular mark. He's, he's controlling the currency, isn't he? He's controlling the money. All the power of everything is given to this one man. When we go back to Genesis chapter number 11, it takes place in Babel, which is Babylon. And it tells you specifically it's the land of Shinar. What do they do? They become one people. They become one nation. What are they doing? They're all speaking one language. There's a movement today in our earth that is, that is trying to bring everyone together, isn't it? A very strong movement. That it's, that it's great, it's good, <coughs> that we all speak one language. Almost every nation today, when, when they're little children, we learn Spanish because that's the most relevant language that we're taught because we live closer to Spanish speakers. You know, it's the second most spoken language in our country today. But every country besides... The United States, or every country other than English-speaking countries, do you know what language they learn? English. Almost, the majority of countries, 
you know, those especially that have been growing up for the past 15 to 20 years, they all can speak English. They all can speak English. There will be one language again, just like we see here. There will be, there'll be other languages, because it tells you in Revelation 13, nations and tongues and kindreds. So they speak multiple languages, right? But there will be one language, and there will be one people. And you know who will rule over all that, all of those people? It'll be the Antichrist. You know who will be reigning from? He'll be reigning from Babylon. But well, where is Babylon? Jerusalem. He'll be reigning from the temple. That's where he will be located. So this is a picture of Babylon of the, of the end time. We can see that this is clearly a picture of that. We can see that this picture, for those that, that lived prior to actually Nebuchadnezzar, this would also have been foreshadowing the come of Nebuchadnezzar, wouldn't it have? It would have been foreshadowing the, the empire that later began in the land of Shinar which was also a picture of end times, Babylon. Now, one thing that I want to point out about the Trinitarians, Genesis chapter number 11, verse number 6, they've tried to use this as an example of Genesis chapter number 11, where we're at, verse number 6, that is. They've tried to use this as an example of the Trinity. And if this isn't polytheism, I don't know what is. But it says this in Genesis chapter number 11, verse number 6, And the Lord said... Behold, the people is one. So they look at this verse and they say, they look, they say, look at <coughs> 1 John 5, 7, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Well, when we go back to Genesis chapter number 11, verse number 6, and this is just one of their examples that they'll use. I'm sure they have others, I'm sure. But I've heard them say this. They'll say, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. So notice how they're one. Notice it doesn't mean that they are each other, does it? It doesn't mean that this guy is this guy. No, it says the people is one. Okay, if that's your example of a bunch of people, a bunch of human beings that are one, what are they one in? They're, they're unified as in a nation? Then if, if that's your you know, figure to explain what you believe or your, your analogy... You're just proving further that I'm right when I say you're polytheistic. Over and over again, when these people try to say, oh, you know, a good example is like, I even heard this one time in a debate between a Trinitarian and a oneness Pentecostal. The Trinitarian guy, and this is obviously Orthodox Trinitarian, you know, this guy was like, well, a good example of the, of the Trinity is you have like Peter, James, and John. You know, they're three different persons. They're three distinct persons. That's a perfect example of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're three distinct persons, but one God. No, so Peter, James, and John, they're three distinct persons, but one human being? No, th that's a good analogy. They're three human beings. And this, this picture that they paint of their trinity, three distinct persons, but one God. No, it's three distinct persons, and three gods. That's what they're painting. That's what they're explaining. And the proof of that, you know, outside of just basic reason and what they explain, they have different minds, will, everything that would, that would give you the attributes of three gods, the proof of that further is they come up with analogies like that and like this. The people is one. The people is one. What do they want? In the, oh, they're one nation. Oh, I, I see what you mean. They're one. But then you have all these different people. What are they? They're all different human beings, aren't they? So you're saying there's three gods, you know, they're one god, is in their one essence? Is that what you're saying? It's ridiculous. They're reaching so far. It's, it's almost like, it, it, it's so pathetic. The way that they try to reach and find all of these explanations, it's ridiculous. And you know what it is? It, it truly is a form of polytheism. Right. Saved people having these, these, these warped views of the Godhead. It's, it's, it's so shameful is what it is. Right. It really is. Amen. Teaching just blasphemies. It's ridiculous. Amen. You know, and, and as long as this foolishness goes on, I will continue to make sure that I call it out. Anytime I hear you know, the stupidity, I'll make sure that I point it out to you. Because hope hopefully, you know, I, I don't just you know, enjoy, well, maybe I do somewhat, you know, enjoy getting up here and preaching against it. But here's the thing. I would prefer that all of these idiots would just say, hey, I'm wrong, 
I was being dumb there for a few months. What I was saying, I didn't really believe. I was just kind of stubborn and didn't want to admit it. That's what I would prefer. From the bottom of my heart, that's what I would prefer for these people to do. For me and them. They should, you know, they need to just, just repent of this. Because they're going to receive the punishment one day or another. This is major heresy. Look at it. The people is one. I mean, look at that analogy. Right. When you have hundreds of thousands, thousands of human beings, the people is one. Thousands of human beings. That's a good example. What do you have? Three gods then? It's ridiculous. They're out of their minds. It's craziness. That's what they have. This is their proof text that they believe in three distinct persons and one God. The people is one. Yeah, real good. I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. <clears throat> look at verse number. Look at the end there, too. It's something real interesting at the end of this chapter. It says this. God says this. And this they began. I'm sorry I said the end of the chapter. I meant the end of the verse. Verse 6. And this they began to do. And then he says this. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So notice what he's saying. He's saying when they all come together, <coughs> they can do almost anything that they want. Notice the power that humanity, that God gave humanity. When he gives, you know, the brain is just extremely powerful. And just the ability, the capability, the potential that man has, God even says, you know, there's nothing restrained from them. And that's what we see happening. Some of the stuff that, that human beings are creating nowadays, some of the things that they're coming up with, the technology, it's, it, you know, and what happened? When they started getting, getting you know, they came together, and they're, they're just dreaming up things. They're all working together, the one nation, one people, right? They just start going too far. What does God do? He divinely intervenes. In the past 100 years, there has been just, just a... A catapult forward of you know the industrial revolution, right? It, obviously, that began much earlier, but the technology that is created nowadays is insane. It's crazy. That makes me think that God is about to divinely intervene. I mean, they're taking like the heads off of monkeys and like putting them on other monkeys, and the monkey lives for like 10, 15 seconds and then dies. It's like, what in the world is going on here? You know, God's gonna say at one point. When everything comes together, it's gone too far. They've all come together. You know, nothing's going to be restrained to them at this point. So that, that in and of itself, just the, you know, just how fast the progress has, has come, how fast, you know, the progress is going now at this point over the past just 100 years makes me think that it can't be that much longer before the Lord comes back. It can't be that much longer. It can't go much further. You know, it's crazy, some of the technology, some of the intelligence that man has embarked upon over the past 100 years. It's, it's, it's insane. Amen. Look at verse number 7. It says, Go to, let us go down and there, confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So they were no longer able to build with one another because they were no longer able to communicate, obviously. So God confounded their language. <clears throat> Look at verse 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. Notice that it tells you what Babel means. And like I mentioned last week, Babel is like someone babbling. You cannot understand them. They confounded their language. So it was like someone was speaking unto them as a, as a bar barbarian. They weren't able to... It just sounded like Babel. It was an unknown tongue to them. <clears throat> And from thence did the Lord scatter them, the end of verse 8. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat Arphaxad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad, five hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. And Arphaxad lived after he begat Selah, four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. And Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Selah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 16. And Eber lived 4 and 30 years and begat Peleg. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 400 
in 30 years and begat sons and daughters. As I demonstrated <coughs> to you last week, and I alluded to it at the very beginning of the sermon, the end portion of Genesis chapter number 10, where it tells you about Peleg in verse number 25, it begins this. It tells you that he's called Peleg, it says, for in his days was the earth divided. Well, we see the earth being divided in chapter number 11, when everyone is, the languages are divided, the people are divided. That's what we see plainly taking place. That's why when we get to chapter number 11, it says, And as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. They is referring back to those who he was speaking of in chapter number 10 prior to that. They are the antecedent or those that were dwelling at that time. Well, if you do the math, Peleg was born 110 years after the flood. If you add it up, Peleg was born 110 years exactly. And you can just add up when each person was born there, verses 10 through 17, and it is 110 years. You can check my math on that. 110 years after the flood. So the Tower of Babel took place roughly 110 years after the flood. So they had 110 years to come together, to build, to be unified, and to work on this tower and this city and to live together, right? For 110 years. And the they there, as I said, was referring back to those that were dwelling on the earth. So when we get down to verse number 31 in chapter number 10, it says, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. Notice again, they're speaking different languages at this point, right? In their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth. A direct reference back to... Verse number 25, was it? Or verse number, yes, 25. It says they were divided in the earth after the flood. So that took place, that division took place 110 years afterwards at the time when Peleg was born. Now, if you think about this, was he divinely or, or providentially named Peleg? Did, did, did it, was he named that prior through prophecy because God knew God, you know, had through the Holy Spirit his father named him Pele because he knew that he was going to be dividing the earth. Or did they change his name? Because people's names are changed very often. But roughly we know that it's around 110 years after that. Now I, I went back again for two purposes. Number one, I went back to Genesis chapter number 10 because I wanted to point out the format of the Bible very often. At the end of Genesis chapter number 10, you have the genealogies of the three sons of Noah, Right? You have the genealogies of the three sons of Noah, which is an introduction for Genesis chapter number 11, isn't it? With that logic and with that explanation leading up to the nations being divided, then he slightly backs up, doesn't he? You understand what I'm saying? Well, I want you to look, when we get over to Genesis chapter number 11, the same thing happens again. So basically, Genesis chapter number 10 is a preface to Genesis chapter number 11. Well, the same thing happens again with Genesis chapter number 11 and Genesis chapter number 12. This is the format. Now, obviously, we didn't have chapters prior to this, but it's still these texts that I'm referring to as chapters and verses. They're in the order of being an introduction and then a story. So if, when you look over Genesis chapter 11, the story is done in verse number 9. And then verse number 10, he starts going through the generations again, doesn't he? He goes through the generations all the way, and he goes a little bit further this time, all the way down to who? Abram. But, and then look at chapter number 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. Notice he said unto Abram. Go back to Genesis chapter number 11. When did that happen? Look at verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father in Terah, before his father Terah, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, look at this, to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Then we get to chapter number 12, verse number 1, and it says this. 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram. Now when did the Lord you know, come and speak to Abram to leave the country? If you look at Genesis chapter number 11, what verse particularly would that have happened? Or what, when was the timing? It would have been the very beginning of verse number 31, right? It says, and Terah took Abram his son. And notice where they're going. The very end of the verse, it says, to go into the land of Canaan. Well, when you look there in chapter number 12, verse number 1, God's telling Abram, hey, I want you to go into the land of Canaan, isn't he? So what happens? God gives you a rundown, the introduction, and then he backs up a little bit, doesn't he? He starts giving you the specific details of what took place. He gives you the generations. He gives you the genealogy. He gives you a little bit of information about the story he's going to start telling within the, the context of the genealogy. But then he backs up and starts giving you the specifics about those stories. Look back at Genesis 11 again. You have your genealogies there at the end of Genesis 10. You have the description of the earth being divided very vaguely and briefly in the context of the genealogies. He, he finishes it off. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Chapter number 11, he backs up a little bit. And the whole earth was of one language and starts to tell the story. You see that very obvious pattern or format that the Bible has? And notice also one other thing. We're going to read through the rest of these verses and we'll be finished. But one other thing is this. He just gave you the genealogies of Shem. The genealogy of Shem when he gave you the three sons' genealogies, didn't he? But now he's giving you specifically the genealogy of Shem with the timing of when they, how old they were when they had their sons. Why? Because that's obviously the line which we're getting ready to start focusing on. He, but he, he homes in on that line of Shem because who was it of Noah's sons that received the blessing? The main blessing. Shem. Who received the blessing before that? Noah. So it's Noah, Shem, Abram is born later on. God starts dealing with one of the seed of, you know, that, of that line that he had given the blessing to. What happens after Abram? Exactly. You know, Isaac, Jacob. Notice the same pattern? It didn't begin with Abram is my point. That's not where it started. It started with Noah. It started with Adam. And got passed down the line. Noah to Shem. Sam. You see Eber, Hebrew, right? You see Abram come up next. Then you see Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, who? Jesus. So we see this line being focused on this is where the story of Jesus Christ begins. The beginning of time, the beginning of the Garden of Eden with Adam, and then God really starts focusing on when it gets to Shem, right? Of those three sons, he has that one line that he's going to be giving the blessing to. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ comes of that line. So he starts giving you more details of Shem because he's getting ready to focus on that specific genealogy. Let's read through here quickly. Look at verse number 18. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Reu. And Peleg lived after he begat Reu 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Reu lived two and 30 years and begat Sarah. And Reu lived after he begat Sarah 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Sarah lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Sarah lived after he begat Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah and hundred and nineteen years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 26, and Terah lived seventy years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now you can do the math here because the line of Shem, he gives you the age in which the person was when they had their son. Abram was only 269 years after the flood. So that's not that long. When we think about Abram or Abraham, you don't really put it into perspective always, but it was less than 300 years his father, if you will, great-great-grandfather, got off the ark, Noah. 300 years, less than 300 years, 269 years before that. I'm sure there was tons of stories. Not only that, people were still living. Their age expectancy started to go down at this time. If you pay attention, they're having their sons you know, at a much younger age, they're not living near as long. It's, their age expectancy is slowly going down. The longevity of their life, right, is going down. But 269 years, that's not that long. And plus, people were living a little bit longer than I'm sure he had all kinds of stories that people knew, you know, about, you know, he, you know uh, uh, things that had taken place, the Tower of Babel, 
close, you know, people that he was very, you know, closely related to that were living for a long period of time that were able to really say, hey, I knew this person that knew this person that saw this. That's super interesting. You know, uh, but we, we need to kind of put things into perspective when we're reading the Bible. That's why these genealogies are real important. Not even 300 years before that, his great-great-grandfather, you know, on and on, got off the ark, Noah. He's of the line of Shem. Look at verse number 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. <coughs> and Haran begat Lot. So Abram, Nahor, and Haran are Abram's brothers. Haran begat Lot. So Lot is Abram's nephew. Look at verse number 28. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity. That's where he's from. That's where he's born. That's what nativity means. In Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Verse 30, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. Verse 31, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So what we see here at the end of Genesis chapter number 11 is the same pattern in which the whole Bible really follows. And especially here in Genesis, where the Bible will give you an introduction, and then it will back up and give you more specific details about what's taking place. And what we're getting ready to get into is a very profound story. It's really the beginning of, you know, I don't want to say the beginning, obviously, of the book of Genesis, because there's great truths before this, but let's say this. It really switched gears, it really switches gears, and it really starts speeding up here. There's much, there's, you know, a lot more stories that are being told from Genesis 12 to Genesis chapter number 50. There's a lot more things that become relevant, you know, uh, more relevant, if you will, to you know, uh, the New Testament scriptures, things start to become, uh, you know, more often quoted in the New Testament scriptures, stories that we may be more familiar with. This same pattern, and I'll point this out to you, and this is, uh, you know, because I preach a sermon about answering the atheist Sunday morning and Sunday evening. This same pattern of an introduction at the end of a chapter and then the very next chapter, it backs up a little bit, back into further than somewhat of what the introduction is, can be found... <clears throat> With Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter number 2, if you want to look at that later. There, it's actually just repeating a lot of the same things from Genesis chapter number 1. And that is oftentimes where atheists will bring that up and say, you know, hey, you know, there's a contradiction here with this, this, and this. But it's really because he's just retelling the story. He backs up and he gives more specifics. And this is a format. You need to understand the way that the Bible's laid out. It'll make you, it'll, it'll make it easier in your Bible reading to understand, you know, uh, the timing of things and what's taking place one event after the next. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, that it is coherent. It's, it's so easy to be understood, dear Lord. Uh, we, we thank you, dear Lord, even for some of the uh, very few hard-to-understand passages, dear God. Uh, that it, it uh, creates discipline in us and, and helps us to study your word. We ask you, dear God, that you would bless the rest of our Bible study through the book of Genesis, that you would help this to ignite a love for your word and a love for the book of Genesis and all the hearts of those that listen to this uh, sermon tonight, dear God. We ask you also that you would help us even in the, the chapters that, that aren't as packed with uh, meat and, and they're not as filled with as, as much uh, entertainment, dear God. <coughs> Uh, with the things that we're used to being entertained with, that you would you would still help us to love these chapters and to love your word and to uh, be uh, diligent students and still studying all of these things out and learning things from it. We ask you to open our eyes each time we study your word. Be with our church and, and bless us and help us to grow. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.